So um, I'm very happy to welcome all of you to this seminar that is organized and sponsored by the Biomed at Tau Research Hub uh, on microbiomes in health and disease. Uh, and this is my absolutely great pleasure to introduce our speaker today, uh, Professor Ruth Lay. Uh, I know Ruth for uh, quite a bit of time and I actually looked through my email to see when was the first time that we met. And, and apparently it was probably three months after I opened my lab back at UW and she uh, came to give a talk at, uh, at the department back in Seattle. Um, in, you know, in real life, the way it was used back then. And I remember I was simply blown away by both the research that you presented, by the very unique data um, that you generated that after this talk, I sent her an email and said, basically every data that you have, please share it with us. It, it, was, it was really so unique back at the time and still is to this day. Um, so just to give you a kind of a formal uh, background, uh, Ruth did her undergrad at University of California at Berkeley. Uh, then a PhD at Ecology and Evolutionary Biology at uh, University of Colorado at Boulder and uh, a short postdoc there before moving to the Temple of Microbiome to Jeff Gordon's lab at University of Washington, um, where uh, she um, did a, a really wonderful postdoc with numerous studies that I still think are some of the iconic microbiome uh, nowadays. Um, she then took a faculty position at Cornell uh, first as an assistant professor, then as an associate professor, until uh, about five years ago, she decided to move from uh, the cold Cornell to uh, another cold city, I guess. And uh, she is now the director of the Department of Microbiome Science at Max Planck Institute for Developmental Biology uh, at uh, Tubingen, I'm probably uh, butchering the name. Um, and uh, really, I think Professor Ruth Lays is one of the um, leaders in microbiome research and has published really iconic papers that to this day uh, are some of the first paper I give to every student that comes to the lab. And she, I think what was amazing to see just how many topics she worked on, ranging from the interaction between microbiome and obesity. Um, she was uh, the first to generate a really dense temporal microbiome uh, data from infants. Uh, she looked at the um, hereditability of the microbiome, and I'm sure she'll tell us about some of those things uh, today. And so uh, just before um, letting the mic uh, to Professor Ruth Lay. Um, I do ask that if you feel comfortable with opening your cameras, please do so. I'm pretty sure that it will be more fun uh, to uh, actually see the people that, um, that are here than just their names. Um, and with that, um, let's hear from uh, Ruth. Thank you, Ruth, for coming, for, for at least being here. Okay. Well, thanks so much, Halanan, for, uh, for that really nice introduction. I, I also vividly remember visiting you back in Seattle at Genome Sciences, and it made a huge impression on me at the time. I was thinking, wow, these guys are really, really doing amazing things. And, and the, the environment, um, the environment that, that, that you guys had created there was, was super impressive to me. It actually, it actually stimulated me to switch departments when I got back to Cornell, actually. Uh, but that's a different story. So th thanks a ton for inviting me. Um, I, I really wish I could be there in Tel Aviv with you, because um, uh, I, I only just experienced Israel last year and uh, I was uh, thought it was a really fantastic uh, place to visit. So hopefully someday again. Um, so as Hel Elanan said, um, I, I, I started my lab at Cornell um, and then four years ago moved here. Um, so this is where we are now. I'll just grab the, um, the laser pointer. So we're in southwest Germany in Tübingen um, at one of the Max Planck campuses um, where we're um, a, a bunch of biologists with some, um, some people who do weird robotic stuff and some other people who are into machine learning and, and that sort of thing as well. So it's a, I hope you get to visit us sometime here as well. And before I start, I'd just like to thank various iterations of my lab over the, over the years because I'm gonna give you a talk that's a bit cumulative to show you what, what we've done to pursue some of these topics. As Elhan said, I tended to jump around, but I'm trying to change my ways and actually go deeper on some of these topics, which I'll, um, so you'll see what we've been doing. And so just a big shout out to all these people who've worked on these topics over the years to begin with, because they're the people who really do all the work. So I'm gonna use the microbiome um, as a word uh, to mean Basically microbial community, that's the way I use it. And I can't change my ways. And so that's what I mean. And I'm gonna talk about the ones in the gut. So when I say microbiome, I just mean a bunch of microbes. Um, so as you know, we were born uh, relatively germ-free. 
I, I think we're born germ-free at any rate. And then we're colonized by all the people around us. And of course, we're exposed also to all kinds of other environmental microbes. Um, but it's really the ones that we get from other people that I think stick the most, okay? Um, and, and constitute the, the human microbiome. And so, so we know now from, from everyone's work over the last 10, 15 years that this, this gut microbiome increases in complexity and diversity over time. Um, and is influenced by many things that are environmental, um, from lifestyle to diet to uh, your, your local environment, to how sick you get and your health status and so forth. Uh, what, what we were interested in asking early on um, was what about host genetics? And as Alhanan said, um, uh, sorry, so, so yeah, so the, the basic question being, um, do you have a genetic predisposition from, for anything to do with the microbiome, but, but what we can measure is microbiome composition and we can quantify that. We can look at um, the, abundant, the relative abundances of different microbiota across populations. We can do that fairly easily. So, so that is, a, we, can, we can generate quantitative data uh, for relative abundances of taxa and then ask the way you would use for any trait, is there a genetic component for that? And, um, Going into this, as Elhanan mentioned, I was working with Jeff Gordon and uh, back in 2008 already, um, Jeff Gordon had, with Pete Turnbow, the lead author, put out this paper about obesity twins, um, using this to show that there was really no measurable effect of host genetics on the overall diversity of the gut. So uh, this is unifrac here, unweighted unifrac, uh, which is a, just a measure of how different microbiomes can be. And if there's a host genetic effect, you'd expect a difference from monozygotic and dizygotic twins, which there wasn't. Um, but we thought, okay, maybe this is actually underpowered to pick up anything. And then it's a, it's a broad measure. So, so going into this background of no, um, we did this study, which is already uh, a few years old now, 2014. So working with Tim Spector out of King's College London, who has this big Twins UK population, um, we sequenced the microbiomes by 16S of uh, lots and lots of twin pairs, um, fraternal and identical, in order to, to get at this question. Um, and generating data like this, so for any, for any uh, type of microbe that we have quantitative relative abundance data for, we're looking for uh, fit for within twin pairs um, that would be different for DZ and MZ uh, dizygotic and, and monozygotic twins and use this as a basis for calculating heritability. And um, <clears throat> this is what the data looked like. Uh, so this is a phylogenetic tree of um, the, 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 the microbiota that we found in these twins. And each branch is colored now by the strength of the heritability, which, which is uh, a measure of the genetic effect on the variation uh, of the variance that you see in, in, the, in the data. Okay, so if there's, if there's a genetic influence, it's gonna come out as painted um, red on the tree. And so you can see a lot of green and blue, and this is what we'd expected, right, from previous work, that for, for a lot of these taxa, there's no genetic effect um, on their abundances across the population, but then for specific ones, you start seeing these signals. And those are these needles in the haystack, red uh, branches. And so those are the ones that we're honing in on. Those are the ones that are so-called heritable, meaning that if you're looking at their variants in their relative abundance across the population, knowing the host genotype will help you better predict um, that relative abundance. That's what we're talking about. So it's a it's statistical modeling of the variance in the data and taking into account genotype. Does it help you? Yes, no. How much does it help you? That's the strength of the heritability. So another thing we noticed in this data set was that the most heritable thing that we had, because we could rank them, was this family Crisinciliaceae, which, uh, which was very newly, dis newly described in the literature. So this name um, wasn't available to Google because there was nothing on it. It had just popped up. And we'd never heard of it, so we were also surprised by this thing. And it formed co-occurrence net co-occurrence network with a bunch of other things, including the methanobacteria. Okay, so archaea that make methane. So this is primarily methanobrevibacter smithii driving this signal. So we have a co-occurrence of things that are heritable, and 
Another thing that was surprising about this is when we looked across uh, our data set for obese, obese versus lean, we saw these guys enriched in the lean people. And um, so Jeff Gordon had pioneered this kind of study where you take a, a microbiome from an obese donor or a lean donor, put them in germ-free mice, and then you, you can see whether some of the phenotype is transferred. So this was classic, um, uh, sort of a classic functional output where you could show that just having a, an obese microbiome could transfer some of that increased adiposity to the, to the recipient mice. And what we did was add Kristen Sinella to an obese microbiome, and sure enough, it um, to see if we could uh, if we could rescue this this adiposity. If if this having more of these lean associated microbes, and this was the only available type culture at the time, um, if we could if we could drive leanness in the animals. So we did this experiment: obese microbiome plus or minus Kristen Sinella, live dead. So we're just mixing it in. We're mixing in these cells to an obese person's, person's microbiome and giving that to germ-free animals. And what we saw was a reduction, a, re a relative reduction in the amount of weight and adiposity in these animals and differences in, in things like acetate as well. So, <clears throat> so from this study, we had a list of heritable gut microbes. Um, we had Kristen Sinelli, she ate in a hub of co-occurrence with some other things, including the methanogens. Um, this, this whole heritable consortium of correlated things was associated with a low BMI. And when we added Kristen Sinella to an obese microbiome, it transferred some of the reduced, uh, it, it reduced the adiposity gain. So since then, we've been interested to see if any of this um, stood the test of time. And one of the things that had, has stood the test of time is these, this list of heritable microbes. So we reviewed this. This is already something we're going to have to do again. But in 2017, um, um, uh, uh, there were already a bunch of papers available that had looked for heritability in different ways. And this is the, the taxa um, that have found again and again in different studies across different parts of the world um, and the degree of heritability, which is very much dependent on the sample size. So this is why these bars sort of go up and down. Um, but what was kind of interesting to see, or pretty cool actually, was that um, a lot of these taxa that we'd picked up are being picked up again and again in different populations. And, and, um, and this is something that, that there's more and more sort of evidence that there's something going on with these guys. Um, they, they get picked up again and again in these heritability studies. And I'm going to stress a little bit the family Christensenaceae and the genus um, Methanobrevibacter because these are the guys that we've been following up on most here. Ruth, can I, can I ask a question? Yeah. Um, since you, you mentioned that uh, all those bugs that seem to have some irritability are also co-occurring, can you separate between um, bugs that um, are really uh, affected by the, the host genome versus those that are affected by the co-occurrence of one that's affected by those genomes? No, I don't think so. No, no, we're nowhere near being able to do that. <laughs> uh, someday, maybe. But yeah, they because of power or because of hmm? simply because you don't have enough power in the in the data, or oh, we might not just have enough data and power in the data. Um, mm -hmm. We might not. Uh, so for a lot of them, we don't know why they're heritable. Um, we don't know what what it is about the genotype that that's giving the pat that's giving the signal for one. Um, yeah, it could, uh, we're, we're we just don't know yet. Um, okay, so so one of the things we've done is is look for the co-occurrence of Christensenella and the Methanobrevibacter. Um, so just recently, we we pulled out um, a couple thousand metagenomes from ten different studies, and using the using the now um, using available genomes of the Christensenaceae and the Methanobacteriaceae, we could see that they're they're correlated ac across populations, which is Kind of interesting to see it wasn't just in the twins uk but uh, across different kinds of people from different places um, you can see that these things correlate and that they also correlate with a low bmi um, so that they have really high prevalence you can find them in pretty much everybody at, at different levels um, but their levels are correlated with with bmi across populations um, we also have been looking in the literature to, to keep an eye on what other people have been um, picking up here. So this was a little review we put out in 2019. 
And uh, this, for instance, is um, as of 2019, a, a list of studies where they report an association of Christian CHA with, with a low biomass, a low, uh, sorry, low BMI body mass index. Um, so we, we just took a look just recently to, to, to see how this was going um, si since then. So it was just what studies we could add in the last couple of years. And the, the size of the dot now tells you, uh, gives you an idea of the, the number of um, subjects in each, uh, each one of these studies. And you can see that uh, also in Israel, um, there's, an, there's an association with uh, Christian Malachia and a low BMI. And um, if we add in also healthy metabolic uh, parameters like, you know, uh, triglyceride levels or things like this, it expands the number to include some in, in other places as well. So this is, this is uh, in our eyes, starting to look like a biomarker of health. Um, so a lot of these are coming out of 16S studies. And in contrast, if you look at other studies that might be looking at metagenomes, um, there's this issue where they, they might not even mention um, this, this family. Uh, so for instance, here's another paper came out 2019 from um, Tim Spector with, with the same twins that we looked at and, and never mentioned Christens and the HCA. And this is because they've been using Metaflan 2 for taxonomy and it doesn't have Christens and the uh, genomes in it. Um, Metaflan 3 does, uh, but, but anything that, so, so there's been, um, uh, uh, you know, be because with the metagenomes, people rely on these ready-made um, databases for taxonomy assignment. There's, there's, uh, you, you can't always, uh, so you have to be careful of what's talked about and what's represented given, um, given, given what they saw. It's sort of like, you know, where you, where you look, under what lampshade you're looking in a sense. Um, because of this, uh, and for our own work, we realized that we needed to be able to customize our databases. And so I just want to shout out uh, to shout out for this paper that Huckabo and, and Nick from the lab put out in bioinformatics, um, a pipeline for building custom databases so that you can rapidly update your databases. Um, Nick just put out uh, one that's uh, more efficient. Um, so so if, if your favorite microbes aren't showing up in people's studies, it might be a database issue, and, uh, but there's, there's ways of correcting this. And so it's a, it's a self-correcting thing, but it does make uh, looking for things in the literature a little trickier than it might otherwise be. All right, so, so we've seen the same heritable gut microbes um, in, in, in other studies. We've seen Chris and Sonella co-occurring with, with Anabrevibacter. The others don't have names, and so people aren't gonna mention them, by the way. Um, we've seen that it's associated with a, with a low BMI again and again. This last one, adding it to an obese microbiome, and, and uh, th that is something that we seem to be the only ones who've done. But we did do it again in Germany with, uh, with, with different, you know, a new setup here. And we did confirm this. So this is 16 uh, mice per sex, and we did it three different times, males and females. Um, and again, whenever Chris and Snell is added live, we get mice that aren't as, as big on average or as fat. Um, what was interesting though, and uh, because we we're interested in trying to figure out why this is happening, um, we got some behavioral data on these animals by putting them in cages where their movements were tracked, can be tracked automatically and how much they drink and how much they move and, and how much they eat is automatically tracked in, in these, um, these cages. And what, what we're finding here is that um, the mice that get Christensenella are, are reminiscent of uh, how they describe thin people as being like twitchier or moving more sometimes. Um, they're, uh, they nap less during their active time. Um, when they're, when they're uh, this is their inactive time during the day. So the, the, the amount of time during their active phase that they spend napping for females is less. Um, they also kind of fidget more. So they don't necessarily drink more, but they like to go up and tap the water hopper, for instance. So these, these animals are just kind of more awake and more active. Um, the males as well, this is the time they spend drinking. And for the males, we see also that they, they, they have a greater distance run. 
So um, for us then, the questions are, um, how are these activity levels altered? I can't tell you, we don't know. Um, you can invite me again in 10 years, and maybe we'll know, but that's what we'd like to find out. Another thing we've been looking at is, um, does this co-occurrence network actually reflect a, uh, an interaction network? Or as maybe <laughs> Elhanan was hinting at, do they just prefer the same conditions and that's why they co-occur? Um, so remember, Kristen Siechia is in the middle of this hub, um, and it makes it makes um, it, it makes CO two and, and hydrogen. It's a little fermenter, whereas the uh, methanogens, of course, make hydrogen. And so you can easily come up with a, a hypothesis here that these guys are actually um, going to be cross feeding. So um, the the family Kristen Siechia is. Um, quite small when you look at the cultured representatives, which are shown here, and there's one called Catabacter that's misnamed. Um, there are, of course, also a lot of mags, um, and there's actually a huge diversity in the mags if you start looking through metagenomes and assembling them. Um, there's a lot of super interesting stuff in the family in the form of mags, um, which will be really interesting to explore. And I've already talked to a bunch of people who are really interested in those genomes. Um, but for the ones that you can work with in the lab, this is what you're looking at so far um, from the culture collections. And again, um, Christensenella minuta is the type strain that was deposited in 2014 by Moratomi et al. And, and these guys are just little, little fermenters, um, really. Um, whereas, of course, you know the methanogens. I don't think they need any introduction. Um, Methanobrevibacter smithii, most prominent gut methanogen, takes CO2 and hydrogen or formate and makes methane. Um, so it's easy enough to think, okay, these guys, uh, this one's feeding this one. And um, so we've been, we've been growing them in the lab. This, this is how they look. Uh, Simenuda forms these really nice rosettes. And if we add um, the methanogen, it's, it, it, it nestles right in there. So this is a close up of a biofilm by SEM. You can see the methanogens are right in there um, attached to the Christensenellas. And this is work by Sophia Elizondo in the lab. So in fact, if you uh, throw Methanobrevibacter smithii in a bottle with C. minuda, <coughs> it, grows, it grows really well. Um, you can see uh, hydrogen at first go up and then it gets drawn back down and the methane goes up and you get these, um, these, these biofilms that are visible by eye that are um, the methanogens nestled in with, with the Christensenella. So we've started to grow them under steady state in bioreactors um, with a medium that allows glucose to be the sole fermentable carbon source so that we can then um, look, at, uh, look at how they behave under steady state conditions. And um, so this is, what, this is what you see. So these are, uh, this is a time series of um, either C. minuta alone or the co-culture C. minuta plus M. smithii in darker blue. Um, and so the, the, the ramp up phase uh, at the beginning is more like a bottle. And then once they go into this beige phase, they're in continuous culture. Um, and so one of the interesting things is that um, as you as they go into um, continuous flow conditions, you can see that uh, the amount of butyrate gets drawn down in the co-culture. So, uh, and of course they consume all the glucose that comes at them. And what, what you can see is that the, uh, the methanogens somehow uh, direct the, the output of C. minuta into not being butyrate, but rather um, maintains it uh, as acetate. So, so th this is intriguing. Um, it's, it's, it's influencing uh, the metabolic output of C. minuta. And, if, and they actually uh, grow much better together. So these are now qPCR data of both together versus alone. So in this case, M. smithii is given um, CO2 and hydrogen, and it grows better uh, with C. minuta with hydrogen and CO2 in excess compared to uh, just by itself. So there's, there's, there's something about these guys together that um, is beneficial for them both in vitro. So, so both partners uh, benefit and Smithii definitely uses hydrogen produced by Siminuda even when it's provided in excess. And it's tempting to think that um, when they're together in a gut microbiome, 
that they could be somehow directing energy flow differentially. So whether or not this is enough to affect phenotype, maybe a tiny bit, uh, maybe it's just something that contributes on top of other things, well, we don't know. Uh, but this is what we're really interested in looking at really. Um, how does their presence together uh, redirect the metabolic output of a microbiome? So um, about what underlies heritability and the genes. Uh, so this, this one way of getting at this is with GWAS where, uh, so now taking quantitative data, um, these relative abundances of different taxa that we have by 16S or from metagenomes, uh, we can then, uh, for, for every single SNP we have in the genome, ask if knowing the genotype at the genome helps predict uh, the abundance, the relative abundances of these taxa. Um, the tricky thing, of course, is you got to do this test millions of times, which gives you a horrible, um, a horrible uh, uh, multiple testing th threshold. <laughs> Um, and that pretty much kills any GWAS that people do with microbiomes, including ours. So, but you do it anyway, because it's fun. And uh, so with Chris and Seishia, Methanobacteria, there's just nothing, uh, nothing. So forget about even, um, you, you, could be, you could be kind to yourself and go, okay, I'm not gonna, I'm, not, I'm, I'm gonna, you know, look, look at um, genome-wide significance and not study what study-wide significance, for instance. Um, but it's still nothing really to go on. So, but I'm gonna segue now and talk about bifidobacteria with this because um, from the very beginning with the most minute studies, uh, bifidobacterium is, is always showed a nice strong signal um, at, on chromosome two. So as far as I know, this is the only one I really trust. Uh, so there's been a, a bunch of these GWAS type studies, but for this kind of analysis, I think they're all, all so underpowered um, that we're really looking for, for the same signal to come up again and again. And that is really the case with the bifidobacteria. So what's happening with the bifidobacteria, they're giving a strong signal on the chromosome two. Um, and if you zoom in, it's the, um, the LCT locus, which is predictive of whether or not you have lactase persistence as an adult. Um, and this is predictive of the relative abundance of the genus bifidobacterium. And so it seems like there's something uh, quite possibly simple going on like this, where if you have lactase non-persistence, so you're not making lactase as an adult, um, and you, uh, so now you drink milk or something with lactase in it, the bifidobacteria will be enriched, versus if you, uh, if you uh, persist in making your own lactase, and so now you're in competition, with the bifidobacteria and they don't get much or they get nothing and then there's lower there's lower amounts of this so lactose is supporting the bifidobacteria and there's a nice um, relationship between genotype and these guys around lactase uh, and lactose we were a little frustrated that it stopped at the genus level so we went looking um, to see if there was anything going on at the species level um, by looking more deeply into uh, AA and GG, so uh, twins uh, with different genotypes at the LCT locus, GG would be the, the non-persisters. So these are lactose tolerant and these have possibly or most likely lactose intolerant as a, as a result. But what we see is that regardless of the kind of twin you're in, so these were UK twins again, um, it was the same ranking of the uh, same population structure of the bifido species. So it really didn't matter. Um, and, and Victor Schmidt, who did this analysis, came up with this analogy that, that it's a rising tide uh, lifts all boats type of thing. That if you're in the GGs and you're not making lactase, um, you just get more of all of the bifidos and they don't actually rearrange in any way. It, it helps them all. And we were still frustrated. So then we went looking at the uh, strain level. Uh, for this, we needed more data. And um, so we decided to pull out bifidobacteria genomes um, using a capture array. And we got 30 fold enrichment of bifido DNA. And we, we looked at this closely. And this was Hagainav in the lab, um, had fun developing a synteny based tool for comparing strains. And even though we see from this that twins with, within a twin pair share the same strains and that for people over time, the strains are stable, it made absolutely no difference if they were in a GG or an 8A genotype person. 
So again, it didn't matter. Uh, so we, we, we were frustrated by this genus level result that came out of the GWAS, but in fact, that is the result. Um, the, we have not been able to find anything at a, at a, a, um, a, a tight, you know, finer resolution. So, so really it is that they, all the bifidos prefer GG people. That's just the, the, the basic finding there. Um, but it, it got us thinking about how something like uh, this genotype arises. So lactase persistence is, a, is a, uh, something that arose in different parts of the world during the Neolithic. It's got a huge signature um, of selection on, on, on human populations that, that underwent um, bottlenecks, um, I think, of, of selection um, for being able to continue to produce lactase as adults. And geneticists, are like this is taken from Sarah Tishkoff's work, um, a review that she has. Um, geneticists know of, of markers of selection, of strong, um, strong evidence of selection in human populations around the world. Um, lactose is, is one of them, um, but there's others. Uh, there's peop as people spread around the world and adapted to local environments, um, they adapted genetically and we can see this in, in, the, in, the, in the, the variation in the genetic makeup of populations around the world. And so we started to think, oh, well, this is neat. Maybe, you know, because there's such a strong signal for lactase, maybe um, in the microbiome, maybe this is a map to start looking at other microbiome signals that, that might reflect these genotype differences that people have around the world. And so another one we've looked at is starchy food. Um, amylase is the enzyme that breaks down starch and it's produced in humans in the salivary glands and in the pancreas. Um, and glucose, of course, um, is liberated when you, when you break starch. Um, but the microbes in the gut also have plenty of amylases. And if they use theirs to break, uh, to, to break starch, um, the short chain fatty acids uh, the, that are going to be produced from this are energetically less energetic uh, compared to glucose. And so it does put the host possibly in a competition with the gut microbes over um, being able to use starch. So you'd think one possibility is that if you use your host enzyme, you're going to get more calories out of starch. And this might have been a, a driver to make more salivary amylase, which is what happens when you have more copies of the salivary amylase gene. So the basal state is to have two copies, but in humans, it can range anywhere from two to 20 copies. And you see this uh, in, in every population you look at, there's actually a range, quite a, quite a nice range um, of, of copy number uh, in, in anywhere you look. And there's a really nice relationship between the copy number and the, the um, amylase activity in your mouth, which, which you, can, you can measure easily. So, we were curious how this related to microbiome composition. And uh, so we, we had our twin microbiomes again, and we picked those with a normal BMI. And then, um, uh, so a, a copy number of genes is not something that you get from these gene chips. But in the case of Amy one um, we could actually use seven SNPs that were predictive of it and predict um, the copy number for all these subjects and then look at the extremes, compare the microbiomes. And what we found was that people with a predicted high AMI1 copy number had higher relative abundances of rumococcus. So um, at the same time, we were doing this diet intervention study at Cornell. So this is the work of Angela Poole, who's now a professor at Cornell. And what she did was bring in over hundred Cornell University students, measure their AMI1 copy number directly um, using a variety of methods. And then um, she took 25 students and um, enrolled them in this month long study where they were on a standardized diet during the middle two weeks and they gave saliva and stool samples weekly, three times a week. Um, and we kept track of what they ate in addition to what we gave them. And then we also paid them a lot of money. Uh, so we were paying undergraduates to eat, which they appreciated very much. And this is the kind of stuff they ate. So we wanted to make sure that they ate starch basically at every meal. So we gave them pancakes and things like this. And uh, finally, comparing the microbiomes over the whole month, um, during that middle period, they, their microbiomes actually converged, which was interesting to see. 
Um, but regardless of that, what we saw was that uh, it was like with the twins that with a, with a high Amy1 copy number, we see more of the ruminococcus. They also had more short chain fatty acids in their stool. And we could see some shifts in the, the abundances of these carbohydrate active genes. So um, we could differentiate the high low copy number of people based on their microbiomes. And then we, we did this germ-free transfer. And so, so here we're taking 25 people's uh, fecal samples from five different time points. And, and for each one, it's one, one microbiome into one mouse. So we had about 90, 90 transfers, individual transfers in this experiment. And, and the mouse now is a low copy number host and it's eating um, mouse chow, which is a polysaccharide rich chow, right? Um, so what's gonna happen when we take people that are uh, lean and the only difference between them is, is um, the copy number of their amylase gene. And what we saw is that the high copy number donors gave us a more adipose mouse on average. And we, we, the way we interpret this now, the way we, we, we think what might be going on here is that when a microbiome is conditioned on a host that makes a lot of salivary amylase, um, the host is getting the, the breakdown products of that and the, in, in, the, in, the, in the proximal gut and in the distal gut, uh, there might be less of these easy starches coming through. And so that microbiome is conditioned on having to go after the more polysaccharide rich fibers maybe, uh, which, is, which is what the mouse gets normally. So that's perhaps why that microbiome is, is better for a mouse. Um, I, I wouldn't go, I wouldn't, inf I wouldn't infer from this that these microbiomes are going to have the same effect on their own hosts for which, uh, on which they've been conditioned, right? This is more of a sort of functional readout test that this microbiome is in general better at eating mouse food for a, a low copy number mouse um, compared to, to this one, which, which is conditioned on a host that has a lower copy number. Um, so again, uh, to, to just recap what I just said, if you have low copy number, um, you're allowing some of these simpler starches to reach, um, to reach the, uh, the distal gut. If you have a high copy number, those are being removed higher up. Um, and so the ruminococcus here are going to be selected for because they're better at going after these resistant starch, um, these, these starches um, lower down the gut. This is really our hypothesis, our data supports this. Um, so this is, this is the model we have here. Uh, uh, but in both, of these, in both of these populations, and so in the, in the twins and then in this, in this Cornell uh, group, we see a, another interaction between um, levels of, of gut bacteria and, uh, and the host genotype. This, type, this time it was copy number of this gene. So for all of these, going back to Sarah Tishkoff's map, um, if, if you look at all these different genetic adaptations around the, around the world, you can actually look in the literature and you can find for, for many of these that people have already associated um, differences in, the, in microbiomes for people that differ at these, at these different um, loci. And it's interesting to think now um, whether, whether microbes have been a part of the process of local adaptation as we go around the world. And it would be interesting to start exploring more of this map, more of these relationships with the microbiome to, to start to think about how microbes have uh, interacted with us as we adapted locally, as we spread around the world. Um, so in thinking about spreading around the world, we, we know that people came out of Africa and spread around the world. and. Uh, there's been terrific work with H. pylori, the stomach microbe, um, where, you know, over the years, as, as people started comparing the strains of Helicobacter, um, the patterns that they show geographically are consistent with people having carried them and vertically transmitted them and carried them as they spread around the world. And, and looking at this, we've also been wondering, um, do are there other gut microbes that do this or, you know, um, and, and how can we start looking at that? Uh, and so we know from, from people who've started looking at, at, at uh, strains like Nicola Sagada's lab with strain flan and, and others, 
we know that when you go to different populations around the world, you'll find different, um, different um, strains of the same bacteria. So for example, this is Bifidobacterium longan. So, so you see that different populations have different strains. Um, what we'd like to know is, does that reflect the, um, the genotype of the, the people? Okay. Um, um, and this has been looked at at the, uh, at, at the level of um, humans compared to, to, our, to our closest relatives. So for example, uh, Andy Mueller and Howard Ackman use Gyre's B sequences to, to, uh, to look at the strains of different taxa from the gut and compare those um, to the phylogeny of the hosts. And so here's bifidobacteria, for example, you have uh, the expected relationship if these things have been tracking their hosts over time. So you have the apes, basil, um, and the, there's, there's, a few, there's a few incongruities that, that look like there was a, a, a jump a jump in the, in the strain from one host to another, but these kinds of patterns are consistent with these taxa having followed their hosts over time and, and co-diversified with them. Um, so we're, we're trying to differentiate between um, uh, this kind of pattern where, where the, the, the phylogeny of the microbes and the phylogeny of the hosts are congruent because they, they, they've developed together versus this environmental filtering that you might see from diet or something where you might get the same pattern for other reasons. And for humans, we can build trees. So this is a human uh, super tree based on based on genotype and, and we can use, um, you can use some of these, these chips, uh, these genotype chips to, to, to build phylogenies. And the ideal would be then to match them with metagenomes and start looking to see if we can see these same patterns in some of these strains of, of different types of gut bacteria. So what you need is matching metagenomes and human genotype data, um, which are hard to come by publicly. It's either one or the other, um, but we generated some as part of a, a different study we were doing, um, we have gut metagenomes from Germany, Gabon, and Vietnam, and we also genotype the people. This is something we did since we've been at the Max Planck. And um, what, what Taichi Suzuki has been doing is now matching the host tree to, um, to, to trees that he makes from strains of different bacteria. So he's got these three places. He's got human genomes that can give him a host tree. Um, from, from these uh, SNP data and then using strain flan, um, he's got um, so far about 50 taxa that, that are observed in enough people that we can match, start matching these trees. And so this is what our human tree looks like and we threw in the twins. <clears throat> so that's why you see four colors. So these are our human subjects and um, you can see the Gabonese here in red followed by, um, by our Vietnamese people. And then we have our Europeans that are both German and UK um, forming this fan here. And so what we're doing now is taking our microbial trees and matching them to the host tree. So for example, here's Prevotella copri. Um, and each one of these branches is gonna be essentially a strain. And so you can see um, these Africa basal strains, and then we we run into to some um, to some some Europeans, but the Prevotella copper is not in that many Europeans, and so we really just have um, Asians and, and Africans here. Here's a nicer example of Ruminococcus with Africa basal, and then we have strains that came out of Vietnam and a bunch of the Europeans, um, with of course some exceptions here. So so what we're doing is. Asking now, well, does this tree match this tree more than you'd expect by chance? Um, okay, I'll show you that in a second. Here's some eubacterium species uh, pointing out with the wedges that Africa is basal a lot of the time that we get these clusters, which is what you'd expect um, from an Africa basal human tree as well. So, so then there's various statistical models that you can, you can use um, and various ways of constructing the trees and Taichi has been running three different models, um, two different types of trees. And this is the list of taxa that are giving us significant uh, co-phylogeny scores. 
um, which are shown in, in orange, right? So, uh, and they're ranked by the most conservative tool here. So we're starting to see co-phylogeny, these non-random patterns come out for a, a certain set of taxa. Um, here's Provotella and Ruminococcus and some of the U bacteria. And then for a lot of them, um, we can also look within a population and see if that holds as well. So just forgetting about the, the three continent or the, the, the big three part structure of the human tree, but just within a population, we also get co-phylogeny. And Taichi then tried to throw in as much data as he could by, um, um, and this is some preliminary work where we're just looking to see if Africa's basal or if we have primate species involved, if we can also um, see primate basal, which is what we'd expect um, from the data that we have. And so every time there's a, a, a black wedge, this is Africa basal, now using um, a lot more public metagenomes as well. And this is a really interesting bunch here. So there's a big red uh, fan in the middle of the Asian ones here for Prevotella coprae. And that's coming out of Madagascar, which we know was settled from both Africa and Asia. And from this, it would look like they brought their Prevotella coprae from Asia with them. Here's Madagascar again for you, Bacterium rectali. Um, and then whenever we throw in some primate strains, they're always basal to all the humans, which is what we expect as well. So Africa or primate basal strains, we see those for nine out of the 15 um, when we look at these trees. So we now have a list of gut microbial taxa that look like they've co-diversified, um, not just between these populations, but within as well, um, especially when we add additional human populations to this. And these are consistent with long-term vertical transmission, just the way uh, we see in, H in H. pylori, same kind of thing. Um, and, and it raises questions about which ones have co-diversified co -diversified and, and how they might have affected our evolution as we adapted to new places around the world and how they interact with us and our human health now. So we've got these genes that are not fixed um, and we see microbes that mirror some of these changes that are more recent in human genotype. And then we've got genes that are fixed, um, which if the microbes are mirroring those, they're all, there's gonna be no variation across the population. So those won't look heritable. Um, and, and we're trying to now understand which ones track human migration, which ones are giving us an idea of, of vertical transmission um, over the, uh, the, the weekend that we can then results in these bigger, large scale patterns and then what it means to be heritable, um, and then which ones of these are interact the most with us um, and the most with our health. So with that, um, I'm gonna stop. I'd like to, to thank um, the, the institutions that really got, got the work going, such as the, the Packard Foundation and the Beckman Foundation and the NIH, and then finally the Max Planck, which is supporting the work going forward. And uh, the, the partners that we've had both at Cornell in the past, um, here now in Tubingen and working closely with the Institute for Tropical Medicine here and their partners has been really useful for collecting some of these, some of these additional data sets. And thank you guys for listening today.